curious to see what they would like to see in, in these areas because um, I think one of the things that's important is, and I, I felt to mention this when I started, I, I've been here my whole life. I grew up here, I went to schools here, I came here through fourth through six. Um, I have my son here, I expect that we're here for, for a while. And um, getting the folks to come back to this town, I think, is important. Um, I, my wife and I recognize the importance of, of putting solid roots down and understanding where we came from. He's actually the sixth generation of my family that's grown up in this town. Um, that goes all the way back to uh, my great 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 grandfather that started Christians and Orchard up on, on Boston Road. So we, we recognize the importance of making sure that this town is not, also, not only viable for the generations that are here, but also for the future generations. So I think we want to make sure that, as everybody has been saying, we want to keep the big picture ideas wide open, um, be able to not isolate or uh, forget about certain age groups, but really this is a place for everyone to really come together. And um, I know we've talked about surveys. I know other towns in Massachusetts do town meetings, so maybe that's something that we look at doing to really make sure that we get turnout for people to come and voice their opinions. Um, so really, uh, I think the, 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 as everybody has said, the, the, the possibilities here are endless. So um, I think uh, we just want to keep that in mind when we're moving forward. And with all the feasibility studies and the master plannings, there's cost estimates that can come along with those so we get an idea of how much things will cost. We can do things in phases. You know, so if we identify that you know, this cafeteria, cafetorium is worth saving, that comes with the next uh, dollar amount. And then we, you know, get this one up and running, and then that's when we start to focus on the other parts of the uh, parts of the areas too. And then I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back on what Gary has said too. Um, we recently completed a project in West, West of Massachusetts uh, as an art and innovation center. It was an old historic library that was abandoned for 20 years. We went in, rehabbed it. It's now a place where the community can go and rent out the spaces to um, have events. They uh, lease it out to local artists to teach classes. So it's a self-revenue generating thing, even though it's in a public building. So looking at something like that to have artist workspaces um, would also, I think, would also be very beneficial to us. That's all. <laughs> Eastern 
inside the town getting more and more gas, and we talked about strategies for keeping Western concern inside more rural. How would the community center help with that process, relieve some of the pressures, give new people who can't stand up here and say, I've been, I've been here since the Mayflower, but give newcomers a place to, to flourish and become part of the community. So I think we should look at our needs that we have right now and consider what our needs are going to be in the future. How is this going to make us transition and become stronger? And so right now we're going to see a huge demand for a community garden. Most people can have their own gardens if they want them. But as we look at answering our neighborhoods, that may be something that we should be looking at. As we look at our uh, obesity rates, it's not the elderly that needs, they do need proactive help, but so do we all. Do we need more space to walk? Do we need more space to help? Things? Yes. So I just would like us to kind of consider where we're at now, where we're going to be in the future, and what is going to help us get there. And this could be a real strong tool for doing that. Thank you. Uh, Tony Gurdon. I uh, first of all I want, I want to thank you again for having this meeting and also for having it here because I think those people who, who are and I'm pretty familiar with this building myself, uh, itself, but to, to see where this is gone now in a very short period of time, to walk out back and this broken window and this glass hole on the stage. So I, I think we need to recognize that it, this is a good starting point, but we can't do nothing. Because if we do nothing, it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse fast. So I, I think there has to be some momentum built around the discussion here today and where this is going to go. So um, like, like Bill mentioned, uh, one of the things we try to advocate for in Parks and Rec is doing what's best for most, right? Because you're never going to get everybody on the same page, and you're never going to get everybody to agree to something. But if we do a needs assessment and we figure out what most people want and what's best for the community, I think that's the direction we need to go in and, and do it right. So uh, we, we've had some challenges with the bond that Gary alluded to back in 2014. And almost six years in now, we're still like not quite where we, where the bond was portrayed we were going to be, nor where we we're going to end up. So times change, needs change, and, and we need to be flexible about what we need, where we're going to go, and to recognize that it's important to get it right the first time, and not have to make changes as we go through, and um, a bunch of people end up unhappy. So I I'm hoping that you're, you're hearing what people have to say here, and I thought John had a great idea as well. We, we try to get things accomplished in Parks and Rec, and um, there's just no money. And we find you know, some funds, we buy the, uh, the building adjacent to the entrance at Pacheco, and we advocate to get that, that entrance widened, and I know what's going to happen, but it takes time. Why does it take time? Because we don't have the funds to do it. So we need to have either a bond, we need to think about a bond, or we need to think about earmarking funds from the projects that are coming in and finding a way to do what's best for most of that money. So uh, uh, some great ideas, and I hope that the uh, council can run them. Thank you. Anyone else? I just want to dovetail on all of these things that have been addressed today, in particular the feasibility study. I think mean, that's that's such a wonderful, uh, you know, make sure of this, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by some of uh, feasibility study, but the, of, of also the architectural study. I want to dovetail on what Mr. Jeff Porter said about this idea of generating income uh, in terms of uh, incubator spaces. So 
So that's a big thing right now all over the nation, particularly in Providence. I've attended uh, various meetings where um, there is a building and you basically lease or rent office space. So there's a lot of at-home businesses that they can't afford to lease you know, large offices and they're starting start up and to pay $50 a month or $60 a month to use that space for a period of time. They have various conference rooms. So basically they have an office and then they have like an all-use conference room where everybody can partake and rotate. That's a great source of generating money that could be built into this idea as well. And in terms of the social and emotional aspect of the multi-generational community, I fully support that. The elderly, the young, people of all ages. And I'm particularly concerned about um, teenagers. I'm on the library board, and one of the things that keeps coming out is that these kids have nothing to do in the community, and they end up going in. Unless you're an academic sort of wheel and you're doing sports, and those kids can't make those middle school or high school teams, they have nothing to do. And so a lot of times the kids are leaving the high school realm will go to the woods, they'll drink, all sorts of money of things, and you've seen some of that disparaging behavior behind the library. Um, but one of the key factors that keep the brochures that keep flying out of the teenage section is, are you depressed? Are, are, you, are you mentally ill, basically? So the kids are looking for things to do and they really feel isolated. So anytime we can connect and sort of build that social connection, it's key. And this would be like the epitome of that center of all of those people to connect with one another. Uh, and this, of course, affects our, our quality of life, but also our health. For everybody involved. So, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I think I'll start out with just one quick comment. Uh, although you keep saying that it's a very large building on a flat map, I think during the master plan stage, you should look at the actual buildable area where there is a lot of wetlands and surrounding this fossil, which is unbuildable. So once you really start getting into what you want to do, I think that's one first step. To see what you actually have that you can use for buildings, parks, and everything else that you present there. Thank you. This land, I can tell you that this land is bisected by, by a brook. They consider it a river. And there's, and there's a hundred foot setback so on that. Off and and, and, we, and we, have, we have the documentation on that. We have this land survey. We do have that. There's as much land on this side of the river as there is on that side of the river. There is, there is almost as much land as you see that's used on this side, on the other side. So you could build another school on the school street side of the thing, but you just don't have access to it from the school street side. But there, we, we are aware of the weapons issue on that here. I think the total of over 20 acres are usable. On the other side? At least total. Total oh, of more than that. Over 20 acres usable. More than that. <laughs> more than that. Okay. Yeah. There's, 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 there's a lot. Quite large. Anyone else? Um, most of the ideas that are here have run through my head and they're all very good. And some people stress some areas more than others. The only one spot that I thought of that I only heard mentioned once is using vocational school. We have people, students going out of district for different <coughs> types of learning educational venues. And we pay to transport them out. The taxpayers paid in town here to send that money out. If we expanded from what they did, I think, just this year, where they implemented three programs, I think. The CTEs are there. That's the new paradigm of education. Right. One was education, one was music, and I can't remember. One is, it, one is engineering. And, uh, and there are some more fields out there that if you touch upon the old crafts that people had, the, the electrical and the plumbing, the automotive and uh, medical, there's so many things out there that not all students are college material not all want to go into professions of that type. And some kids go to college and end up not being able to get a career where they're heads anyway. If we built a boat school here, it would keep funds in town, which by doing that, that funds part of it. 
and then I'm sure that uh, there's always funding out there for education. Just, just to address that, um, my husband by trade is a welder, certified aircraft welder. That's what he did in Texas. Um, and he gets letters from the state of Massachusetts as far as teaching. The problem being, he did not go to college. And in order to teach, I believe, Ms. Head, you need to have a college degree. And the reason the person went into a vocation is because they chose not to go to college. You are not going to get a tradesperson to now go back to school to get in front of a classroom to teach what they've been doing their whole life. So until that thought process has changed, you're not going to get that skilled, hands-on tradesperson. You may get someone to teach you that with a book, but well, I that's don't... For, that's for teaching in a... In a classroom. In, in, a, in an actual school classroom. Because there are, there are plenty of places, like the, uh, you know, the foundry in Providence, where you can learn blacksmithing, right. but you're not doing it for school credit. You're right. learning the location. <laughs> And I think that's more, at least what I heard here, I was sort of right. hearing something no, more like that here, students. not as an extension of the high school, right. so that it wouldn't have that. I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think you have great people that would be willing to step up and do it. Um, I think she's, where they she, I think she's looking at a bigger picture. She's, she's, creating a, she's creating an actual school facility, a learning facility where kids are learning vocational education. And, and, and I kind of just I, I agree with you hundred percent that not everyone goes to college. Believe me. I didn't go to college. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm really good at what I do. My son is, is on the road to becoming an electrician. So I I understand that maybe for, for that one kid that goes to college, there's ten people that don't need to go to college because you need the plumber, the electrician. They need an education. Believe me, they need an education. It's, it's no longer the days that you don't need an education to be a plumber or an electrician. Those days are gone. You need, you need a full education. You need your math and, and English and all that. You, you need everything. And, but like I said, a different idea. And, and that's why we're here. You threw out an idea that I didn't think of creating another, a different type of a school facility on this site. That's what we had this meeting. And the thing is where you have all your some foundations there, it would be perfect for setting up anything that needs to be segregated separately. <coughs> so that you have units there for whichever type of project you are promoting, whether it's plumbing or electronics. Good idea. Anyone else? Please forgive me if, I, if this sounds uh, uh, not intelligent because I'm not very uh, in tune to the process on the government side of things. We've got a bunch of great ideas. We've got a beautiful property that pretty much everybody agrees we need to hang on to. We have challenges in funding. How do you fund these things? And I love the idea of the solar farm creating a revenue stream that's going to help us figure these things out. And then earlier on, we had one small discussion or reference to grant money. And I guess my question is, as we look at all these ideas that are really good about what to do with the place, what is the process for actually getting federal or state grant money for development? And maybe should we be looking at what's available and where the dollars are being spent at this certain time and then kind of try to find a way to use the most dollars we could get and maybe there's no dollars available and I'm just a guy that's talking but if there's, if there's a way to help fund security and preservation of what we have I think that would help help uh, a little bit on the, on the uh, financial side, but we don't necessarily have to pigeonhole into one of these ideas. It might be another way to help develop this, get some grant money, 
And please tell me if, if I'm crazy or wrong, and there might not be any grants, but I, I look at that and say, well, maybe, maybe we need to keep an open mind and find a revenue stream that is not necessarily 100% on the backs of the townspeople, mm -hmm. because we've got a lot of things that we need to fund in this, in this town. So I, I would open that up. Maybe, maybe Gary, because it seems like you were helping out with that grant. What's that process to, to uh, find grant money and, and be awarded grant money? Well, I, I think you know, the whole uh, funding process is, is something that um, it is an impediment, but it's also part of the reason that we are encouraged or required to go slowly so that we don't just go running off in a direction that ultimately disappoints people. We, we need to find those pathways to, to funding. You know, I, I started out by saying the bond circumstance left us with little money uh, for all of this. It's not a criticism, and that's not a that wasn't a message of saying we can't. I don't believe we can't. I believe we got to find what we agree on, and then go do it. And so part of this job is making sure that we all agree on doing something. And in the process identifying um, sources of funding. But you also have to recognize that we, we always have to recognize that we do that. And I don't, I don't think it's a fetus attitude towards it, but 